So I, I missed what the problem with wall assemblies in tropical climates is that you're trying to solve. Okay, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, so the problem is that in you know temperate climates they're sealed, um, and building science is kind of moving in the direction of having these complex materials. Um, so it's really making it more um, open and adaptive. So it's not just wall all the time. It can be essentially a wall when you want it to be. Did that answer your question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> so I, I've had um, the pleasure of having some exposure to, to this project over the semester, and so I feel at liberty. Uh, so I, I just say that as a, uh, if we read it as a as an exercise of, of self-directed learning, I think it's remarkable. Right? So, um, I, but I feel at liberty to be able to ask like a couple of tough questions. Okay. Right? So. I know. Well, so I'll, I'll just say I'll just say that I I, um, the, I still think that the link between photosynthesis and and the wall assemblies and hoppers is, is tenuous. But I don't I don't mind because they're both interesting in themselves, and mm -hmm. and I think we could co-create many connections in this discussion. Right? That's, that's fine. The, the first, we so there are two questions. One one about the, the plant studies and one about the hotboxes, right? The the hotboxes are we. Spoken about this before. There's a there's a you know there's a difference between temperature and heat, mm -hmm. and then when we're talking about le uh, latent energy, it becomes particularly pro problematic because you can have a change in energy without a change in temperature. Mm -hmm. right? And this is uh, something that this this touches on, right? And as so, the question is about the design. Mm -hmm. In in the hot boxes, you're controlling temperature in in the box, right. but for the different examples, when it's not clear in whether and you say the playing field, the energy playing field mm -hmm. is equal in both cases because we're not sure how much energy has gone in uh, to begin with. Mm -hmm. So could you comment a bit about that and say how you might develop, how you might advance the, uh, the prototype? Right? Yeah, and um, you know we have talked about that a lot and I, I think I have been okay with that. It's, you're not getting uh, R values from this test. It's really about um, kind of the same way that infrared photography is used creating uh, a field to see differences. So even though I don't have all the information going in, it's enough to create the differences, which are what I'm trying to see. Can I ask my second yeah, tough question? Because it would just be quick, and then it, which is going back to the plants, right, I need to think that, is, um, so you, you've gone in, in the, on the assumption that um, uh, water evaporation is uh, thermoregulation principle and I, I think you probably learned that it's not it's a kind of secondary effect you know like the, uh, the plants need water for the electron to fix carbon and it's kind of maybe the cooling is secondary I don't know so it, could, could you comment a bit about that learning trajectory and, and how that went and and I guess some conclusions from there well, as a, a water as a thermoregulation strategy the interesting thing about plants and, and life in general is that they're Sometimes it's not really about a secondary uh, effect because plants pull water through as uh, it's the pressure differential coming from the root out the leaf. So it's it's how they move water from the ground into the root through that through the stem through the whole process. So that's one aspect of it. But then a major aspect is cooling. So and and some plants can't survive without. I mean, obviously can't survive without transpiring because of all the other effects. But they they need that cooling effect. So um, I think that that's the thing that's unique about plants that our buildings don't do is that it, it, it's all in one. So it's no secondary. That actually ties into your, um, your idea of the, the wall and the adaptability and the need for flexibility mm -hmm. because the, the plant um, needs heat, it needs the sun, it needs all that. stability based on the water content, we'll just say. And, and one of the things I think is really interesting about some of these tropical environments 
staying cold, mm -hmm. right? Or processing or working with those pressures. And then, you know, you might have some of them, sometimes they have waxy leaves, yeah. for instance, so they can maintain a level of moisture, which I assume that's what you're trying to look at with some of these um, layers. You know, let's say the metal layer. Mm -hmm. I was trying to sort of think plant, how do we bring plant into the building? But then I think there's also, um, you know, some plants that are, are also, they're a lighter color and kind of like fuzzy leaves, mm -hmm. and then some that, that actually will, will sort of hold more water for longer, the succulents, but those are more in a desert yeah. environment than, than here. But the other thing is that they're at different levels within the canopy. So I kind of, when you were first talking about it, I thought, oh, okay, it's gonna be about that. It's gonna be, you know, different levels of adaptation for based on a sort of position. Um, in the landscape and an, uh, an availability of, of solar gain, but um, but it's not. Um, you know, it's it's kind of something else. But I think that the, that the reason I bring it up is just that um, the position of those plants um, speaks to a sort of a, a carrying capacity or an ability, an, adapt an adaptive capacity that um, could be explored using your machine mm -hmm. through a lot of other iterations, right? Yeah. I think that there's a, it's interesting to set up the, the system for for that analysis and to look at different scenarios based on, you know, the, the, the biodiversity that exists even within the, the forest camp mm -hmm. in the tropics, right? So that seems like a really fruitful potential future exploration. Yeah, I would say, I think one of my regrets <coughs> Of this project is that I had never used it to test plants in the same fashion that I test building materials, which I think can tell a very powerful story. So I, I now I have a plant question, then a question, <laughs> another comment. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree that the connection is is tenuous. I think it's more conceptual than it is mm -hmm. physical. Um, for the plants, it's just very specific that you showed. <laughs> only the thermal images of the surface temperature of the plants and the, uh, the ground temperature, but did you also compare the air temperatures? Uh, I did. Um, did you find that they're, same, they're the same? They're the same, it's um, a little more diverse, and I also didn't get ground, the air temperature for every single plant. I did mm -hmm. maybe for four or five. The results were similar to the surface temperature, but it was much more varied, so I couldn't really make any conclusions. But did you, do, did you only look at plants outside, or did you look at plants inside? So, only outside. Because we've done the same thing in Singapore, inside, and conclude that the plant temperature is always the same as the air temperature, no matter what else is, is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting. What's that? Really no, yeah. Um, so that's just an interesting yeah. lesson. Yeah. And and you, I guess you speculated that the like the metal plate is drawing moisture through, but. I don't see how that would happen. Like, was there a physical mechanism that you have in mind of why that would occur? I think it's because the it, it's the condensation, so it's a much cooler surface. So that the moisture is going to want to move from the hot conditions of the hot box through the concrete towards that cavity where it has a cooler surface. But is that surface cooler than it would be is in the case without the metal? Yeah, uh, you mean the You're surface? The, the metal concrete? surface is cooler, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it cooler than it would be without the metal? That was my assumption. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think that I think it would be because it's metal and it's low E. It probably is is colder because it is. You said there's no thermal difference, but I would think there is a thermal difference because it's low E. Mm -hmm. That that's you're basically creating a low E cavity by putting this metal onto the surface. It might depend on the environment. Yeah, and that's, yeah. That's, that's my, my kind of comment. I think talk, my, going back to my original question about what is the, you know, what's the question or the, the challenge to existing assemblies. Like I, I think it'd be interesting to consider as a starting point of what do you really want that assembly to do? How are you challenging what the interior environment and tropical climate should be? And do you want it to be more humid? And how much do you want it to let it vary? Because the mm -hmm. typical approach now is it's going to be a sealed, dehumidified environment. That's not necessary so how does that change what behavior you want out of the assembly uh -huh. well, that's my hard question it's like I'm wondering what does the wall look like yeah 
what, so you've made these observations about the sponge and its behavior in, in high humidity environments about releasing, depending on temperature, releasing or absorbing water. So what does the water look like in that environment? Do you have those images? Um, uh, no, I don't. Um, I think that there's a lot of this is a projection, right? Yeah, and, that, and that's definitely... You might not have the time to design it and test it. I, I, that's definitely the next step. Um, I think the scope of this work was more about creating a way to use um, use this method as, um, as an iterative process. So the next step would be to do the wall. And I, I developed... Um, so the next year I'm spending uh, in a research fellowship in New Orleans uh, on wall assemblies, and what I'm proposing for that work, uh, and the reason I'm not showing it in the super under, underdeveloped state today, is um, essentially bricks made with um, variable gaskets, so that uh, it creates convective pockets and has a variable nature, so it can have um, growing, changing R values, and um, can can use materials like the sponge or or absorptive materials to buffer moisture within the cavity before it passes through the wall. So definitely uh, next step. It's just it's just fascinating because I'm, I'm familiar, you know, from wrestling with this climate. Yeah. But that climate is a different ballgame. Yeah. Obviously that's what your field is studying. Yeah. And yeah. and unarguably, I mean one lesson might be from the plants is that as a uh, they shouldn't have envelopes uh, in tropical climates. Arguably, <laughs> arguably, <laughs> arguably it's, it's it's about having the, the building and the and the spaces be uh, thermal dissipators so they don't exactly. ever accumulate heat and that it, maybe it's the poche particles etc cetera, etc cetera, that are moisture moisture buffering when and thermal yeah. buffering when um, uh, the, uh, the rhythms are in place to do so and right? temporal and, and energy rhythms are in place to do so so what does sponge face look like yeah. <laughs> check back in a year <laughs> well you know it's interesting because uh, you know i had a conversation yesterday with Catherine steve at nasa architect and we were talking about um you know water in the city and we were talking about the ground and um and green infrastructure and putting in um you know more spongy landscapes yes to absorb surface water runoff but then the other issue is that with sea level rise, you end up with a lot of extra water mm -hmm. in the street because you have this place where it's being held. So it's a little bit of a tenuous analogy, but when you put a sponge in front of me, I was like, it's just, you know, I think of the ground and it being a spongy surface. But I think, you know, do you want to actually hold the moisture in your wall or not? Yeah, like that's, that's the issue. It's like, you know, if you're a plant, I want to hold that moisture so I can use it, right? But the wall isn't using it unless maybe you can start to translate it right into your cooling. And maybe that's the answer. Mm -hmm. And somehow it has some like thermal mechanism for that's that's really cooling. exciting because then right? you're using the phase change. Exactly. Yes. Right. Exactly. The water and that's really to powerful. To make a little right. mechanical system. Or it could be for filtering or right? Yeah, so yeah like absolutely. Make the sponge work for you. Then there are proposals out there like that. That is actual, um, when I first started this project, that was kind of my proposal to create condensation and then use yeah. that condensation to power change within the, the envelope. So I think that's another thing that could be tested um, in the next step. Well, and the other thing that we discussed was the idea of combining the sponge with the membrane. Right. Use it as a way to control so that the humidity doesn't get to very high levels. Mm -hmm. At some point, mm -hmm. the membrane would activate. The sponge may not necessarily be in the wall, but somewhere in the, mm -hmm. you know, within the, the zone, um, say in the museum or something, where you want to make sure that you don't exceed a certain mm -hmm. level. Right. Yeah. Safety zone. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So I have a logistic uh, question for next steps. I think it's wonderful to see always when, for many of us, in computer simulation, when you actually build something. And you seem to have the vision that people build something like this and copy your machine. So what do you think are the next steps? You started a bit talking about that this is made for comparative analysis. Yeah. Is this a teaching tool? That how would that compare to when you do a woofy analysis, which I would think is the equivalent of what yeah. most people do today? How does your machine compare to a 
uh, something that we said is three orders of magnitude more expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing using this project as a learning process for me, when you do a woofing analysis, it tells you you get your condensation on this plane after three days or however long. But as I'm reporting data, I'm seeing surface temperature, but I'm also seeing the change in dew point. So it's, um, I learned a lot about how dew point work, how essentially condensation is formed in a, a tangible way. So um, I'm, I'm also going to be teaching at Tulane in the spring. Um, so I want to use this as part of a way to um, teach building science to people who may not be doing digital simulations or, or it's a, a learning tool um, for architects, essentially. But I think it's very valuable and to uh, really clarify what that does and what it is and how it relates to what's out there is to uh, mm -hmm. enhance it itself. Mm -hmm. And it's not sitting on its own and it's a toy, but it could be a lot more, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a way that you can go beyond the conventional Wolfie analysis where some of your new innovative designs where it certainly is not a one-dimensional kind of a wall mm -hmm. where you can help if you have these different cellular structures you're talking about there. It's a good way to explore where the, the analysis part is much, much more difficult. Yeah, yeah. Better start with nature and see what it actually looks like. You're saying like, a, like non homogeneous materials. Right, or how do you dozen it? Right. Yeah. We try to do experiments once of just condensation and fiberglass, and it's just yeah. mm -hmm. horrendous. It's mm -hmm. like not one of mm -hmm. Well, there are no more questions. I can uh, go ahead and wrap up. Probably this is too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are lots of trails by right, that way, yeah. Right? Um, yeah. It's hard because you've set up a machine for doing a lot of different kinds of testing. And um, and if you had led us down a particular path, then we would like totally be into that one path. But because it is open it, it, it leads for a lot of um, did, you, did you think about in tropical climates, like solar radiation on the exterior wall would be very important to how behavior of moisture and being driven inside the wall and you're not able to simulate right. that right now. Yeah, and I, I kind of faked it a little bit by um, increasing the test temperatures to 35C as opposed to what you typically see in tropical climates, which is between 27 and 30. Yeah, yeah, it's not nearly the amount of, same amount of Right, heat. right. Well, it's, it's actually, you know, in the, all those images of the plants, you know, yeah. the, the color has a lot to do with Yeah. Yeah. With the with the with the plants, I really focused a lot on the physiology, the actual function of how um, the different adaptations. Because you're right, you know, if you, if you look at the morpholo morphological route, it's there's so many different things that you can to you can use as inspiration. Um, but with the physiology, I thought it was interesting because it. it the functional aspect of it um, seem to have more similarities to architecture. And I think mm -hmm. the, yeah. the the biomimicry movement has really focused on color or shape or you know kind of the, the morphology of mm -hmm. of plants. All right. Well, thank you.